So let me give a quick introduction. So today we have Professor Frenji, who will tell us about image-based cerebrovascular modeling for advanced diagnosis and interventional planning. And Professor Frenji has a degree in uh, engineering from Barcelona. And then he went to Utrecht and did a PhD in uh, imaging, in uh, model-based analysis of, of imaging, uh, vascular imaging. And uh, then he went to the UK and he is now a professor at the University of Sheffield and um, uh, professor at the biomedical image computing at the University of Sheffield. And he has a very impressive um, uh, scientific career with a lot of publications and he published uh, books and um, he's an editor of a couple of journals of course and serves on the advisory board of the European Institute for Biomedical Imaging Research. And we're very happy to have you here finally when the cap arrived. So please <laughs> come over here. And the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Anja. And uh, goedemorgen. So, my Dutch is a bit rusty, but I still uh, have very good memories from the almost four years I live in Utrecht. And I have a lot of Dutch friends. <clears throat> my PhD at that time was actually in collaboration. Was, uh, I don't know, for some of you, you may remember the IOP program, the Innovatie Gericht, Gericht Onderzoeksprogramma, I think it was that were between the university and a company. So the company that was connected with me was actually Philips. So we've been working since that time with both people in BEST, particularly in the X-ray department and in the medical informatics one, but also you know, with the researchers in both medicines in France and in Hamburg. So a lot of, some of the work that I will present is actually collaborative work with Philips. So I like to, the presentation has two parts, one part that is kind of the story behind the story. So the, the philosophy of what I'm trying to do, career-wise and within the research that I do, and then one concrete example, which is in cellular aneurysms. So the story behind this story is computational medicine, and I'm gonna give one concrete example for, on the area of cellular aneurysms. So what is what I do? Basically, what I try to do is to develop models of um, both patients and also of disease by in <clears throat> trying to analyze patient-specific data to assemble patient-specific models, but also to look into a population of images to assemble sort of more populational models of the disease. Now, why this is important, and yesterday uh, we had a little visit with some of the, your colleagues here, and I was showing this slide that shows the importance that there is for more and more getting not only better access to relevant patient information, so more patient-specific quantification, more quantitative and, and descriptive and effective biomarkers, but also to, under, to have better access to clinical knowledge. And this is what I'm saying when I'm talking about populations, looking at actually what, for instance, is the pattern of normality of a disease? What is the pattern, a pattern of abnormality? How does a particular disease manifest in terms of imaging biomarkers, but also other types of biomarkers? And the need to do that is the need to personalize more and more medicine. You probably know all this story, but I just want to emphasize this plot where they have shown the percentage of GDP that different countries invest on healthcare and the amount of money per capita is the diameter of this box. And this is the percentage of insatisfaction of the healthcare system. So you see that almost it doesn't matter where you are, continent-wise, whether it's a private or a public system, whether it's a regional or a national system, there is a generic problem that needs to be addressed somehow. We need to do things differently. And a number of us believe that actually by making more uh, patient-specific analysis of the information we have about the patient, we can, an, an interpretation of it, we can do better. So I think the underlying issue is, is not just about more data, but it's actually about generating more knowledge with the data that we have. So. There is a few editorials that we wrote when we tried to explain that in different contexts and where we show the combination of imaging and modeling is fundamental. And that's what we call essentially computational medicine, which is applying methods from engineering, mathematics, and computer science to the understanding of disease and to a more rational um, provision of healthcare. You see that the number of publications in this area is growing enormously over the last few years. And 
in our particular group, what we try to have is expertise in the area of computational imaging and signal processing. This is actually where our core expertise lies. We worked a lot with people in the area of modeling, both, uh, as I will explain a bit more later, phenomenological and mechanistic models, and also with people who actually develop uh, image acquisition and signal acquisition domain. So this is basically the inputs, the data, this is how we analyze and process and model it, and this is how we try to make sense of it. We've done it across a number of projects and disease models. I'm going to talk today about the cerebrovascular disease, but we work with Philips as well in cardiovascular with the EU Heart Project, and I've been working as well a lot in, um, in musculoskeletal, and we currently have a project in neurovascular degeneration where Philips is also involved. So, what do we mean by patient specific, by personalizing? What we mean on the one side is to generate um, what we call image-based models. So try to build models which are patient specific, that means either personalize the domain or the initiative of boundary conditions of the models or the tissue types and tissue properties. And by choosing the right imaging modality and by the appropriate quantification models, you can actually make this happen. But you can also think the other way around, model-based imaging. So where we introduce in prior information in the analytics or in the interpretation of the imaging data. Um, so I'm going to show some examples throughout the talk. But basically, there's a few things. First, it's not about prior anatomical model only. It's also about prior physics or prior physiology model. Um, and it's also not just about... Um, imaging in the traditional sense where we just do measurements, but it's also imaging in a predictive sense where you, base on measurements, do predictions of variables that you couldn't measure otherwise, either because they're inaccessible, because they're difficult to measure, or because they relate to the future, and therefore we couldn't do a measurement of something that hasn't happened. Hmm? And I'll explain this a bit in the context of aneurysms, um, fluid dynamics. Now, in a recent editorial, in medical image analysis. This, if you are in the area of imaging, I strongly suggest that you have a look at this edition from October last year from medical image analysis. It's the 20th anniversary of the journal and there is about 20 short editorials which are all sort of visionary papers. So this is one of them of what I call precision imaging which is integrating a bit all these ideas. And one of the things that I argue there is that um, I'm basing myself in something which comes from information sciences and some of you may recognized here that is called the DAKY pyramid and essentially argues that from data which is basically the in my case the images and unorganized with no priors we want to go to a second level which is the structuring and organizing this information in a useful way if you give a context to this information so for instance if, if, if there are measurements of aneurysms diameter and you want to look at the risk of rupture and you know what is the population of aneurysms diameters that are healthy and are in the rupture domain, that is the context, then you can talk about risks. So then you have knowledge. But this is all about analyzing past information. The minute that we can start doing predictions and accurate predictions, we are talking about wisdom, which is essentially validated knowledge. So the problem, I think, is that nowadays we are generating a lot of data and we have some processing methods, but we are less able to actually generate proper knowledge and less less even proper wisdom. And in fact, for a company like you that is interested in changing healthcare, for researchers like me, we have the same interest. We will only make it a help to clinicians if we help them to take better decisions. And that requires the highest level of abstraction of the information. So we really need to be looking into ways to get here. Now, there are two broadly speaking ways of doing that. One is a data-driven approach or bottom-up. That's what I call phenomenological modeling. And machine learning and statistical techniques are just examples of that. And then you also have top-down approaches where you start from uh, principles um, like, for instance, the blood flow is guided by the Navier-Stokes equations or elasticity, sorry, the, 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 the contraction of the heart is guided by the you know, laws of elasticity plus you know, the electrical propagation. And you then do inferences on how those laws apply to a particular geometry of a particular patient given the data you have of that individual. That is where you do more mechanistic models that starts from first principles. And both of them, they are useful in different scenarios. It's not that one is better than the others, but they are useful in different scenarios. Well, I sort of mentioned that. That's the sort of questions that we are trying to answer with, with all of this. Okay, enough of the general story. Now, trying to put this into practice in one 
domain. And I need to warn you that we're only starting to scratch the surface of all that, but that's the guiding vision. Um, for those of you who perhaps are less familiar with aneurysms, they are dilations of the arteries that generate the bulge, and they can at some point explode, and they produce a hemorrhagic stroke. So they are, from the strokes, they are represent roughly 20% of all the strokes. So you also have these ischemic strokes, which are coming from occlusions. So they are kind of a small brother of the strokes. But there is a lot of questions as to what makes them occur in the first place, how they grow, and how eventually they rupture. And the two questions, and I think these are template questions in most of the problems that I've been working, are one is about risk, which are the aneurysms that are at risk of rupture, and the second one is about treatment. If this is going to rupture, which is the optimal treatment strategy? Because usually, and this is not an exception, there is multiple ways of addressing the treatment. So in this case of aneurysms, uh, which perhaps I should have said as well, they tend to occur a lot in the circle of Willis, which is, um, as you know, a circulatory system we have within the brain that nature has made to make us very resilient. So there is a circle in the sense that if you have an occlusion on one of the sides, you can get a lot of collateral flow still from the other side. Um, so they like to appear a lot in the bifurcations. And... Something is also important, especially when we talk later about the stents. There are vessels which we don't usually image or because they're very small. They're called perforators. They're below the resolution, which are the ones that come out of the circle of Willis and feed the brain. That's a reason why when I talk about stents, you will see that we never use grafted stents like in the aorta. Because if you put a graft, you would occlude all the perforators and you will generate a massive ischemic stroke. Okay? So if you wonder why they don't do grafted sense, that's the answer. So the treatments are either clipping, which requires craniotomy to put the clip, or minimally endovascular therapies like coiling, and coiling with, maybe it's not visible there, but there is a stent, because the neck is very wide, and therefore the stent will come out, the coil will come out. Or more recently, what is called flow divertus, which is something in between a conventional stent and a grafted stent. So they, they are not grafted, but they are high... Um, so they, they have a low porosity, so that there is less flow that can go through them. It's not just a wireframe, but it's kind of a very tightly neat stent. Oops. Okay, so the pathology is quite complex, and that's typical of many of these diseases, that they have a lot of elements interacting. So... It's not just geometry, which is what many clinicians currently use. There is also hemodynamics, the wall tension, you know, the wall structure, the potential uh, for thrombosis, the perianeurysmal environment contact. So is this in contact with bone, or is it kind of loose in the middle of the brain, the aneurysm? So it's, it's quite challenging. And everything we do in the end is a sort of simplification of that complex process so that clinicians can take decisions. So the... In that project, Anuris, the, the holy grail of what we were trying to develop was a system like this. We, we developed um, a lot of the components to make it happen, and I'll tell you in the end what was the problem with eventually making it fully realized. But we wanted to have a system, a decision support system, that shows here the, the risk of um, um, death and the life expectancy at every point in time. So that would be age. And this is the accumulated risk of death, and this is the, uh, the life expectancy at every point in time. And what happens when you do anything, and when you have the additional information that there is an aneurysm, but you don't do anything? What happens when you do clipping, and what happens when you do coiling? And how all the different risks start to play. Um, one of the things that clinicians told us is that these sort of tools will be very important, not only for the final decision, but actually to talk the, the patient through. Because nowadays we have more and more literate patients that know everything by Googling. And you need to have answers to why you do X and not Y. And that apparently is quite helpful. Um, so perhaps in the future we need to think that from some of these decision support systems, the user is not just a clinician, it's actually a patient as well, or at least some beast of it. The other part that was the one we were developing with Philips <clears throat> was a, um, a workstation that would go together with the uh, rotational angiography system that will have 
their ability to, do predict, to predict flow on the basis of the anatomy that you will reconstruct from the rotational and geography. And, well, and in the end, what was in the prototype was a super hyper simplified version of all the research I'm going to talk to you. So sometimes the research we do helps to companies make decisions as to how simple they can go, but it still be okay, but it's worth doing anyway. And, and we can talk through as well what, what happened with that. So this is the sort of image processing pipeline uh, that to go from the layer of data to the layer of information and knowledge that I was talking before. So you start from the rotational angio or any other modality, you do a segmentation, then you need to clean this up, generate properly watertight meshes, do you know, volumetric meshing, assign boundary conditions, and there's a whole story about this that we will come back in a couple of occasions through the talk. Then you send this to a number crunching machine to actually solve the Navier-Stokes equations, and there you can do different things. You can do a simple, you know, kind of a steady-state flow analysis, which is what Phillips did, or you can actually go all the way up to do transient flow simulations and complicated stuff there. <clears throat> and then this spits out a number of virtual images, and that's what I'm, for, for an imaging person like me, I don't see a big difference between this and this. This is real, this is, comes from a simulation, but it still is an image from a data structure point of view. And we also need to do a lot of processing. We can't just show a flow field to a clinician. You need to provide some number in the end that is rel related to the complexity of the flow, for instance. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, it, this is not only a virtual image, but it's also a fusion of information. It fuses the anatomy from this, the physiology of the boundary conditions, plus the prior knowledge on the Navier-Stokes physics that comes from the solver. So that's why I'm saying that the fusion or this integration is a lot more than just mere kind of geometric co-registration. Now, if you can do that and you have the tools to do this in a, in a sort of a streamlined manner so that you can just not do one case, but you can run over a full database, you can start creating libraries of, you know, full sets for each patient where the imaging, the general anatomical characterization the isolation of the aneurysms are all the anatomical parameters of the aneurysm, the fluid dynamics, uh, streamlines, wall shear stress, oscillatory shear index, and then you can get all the metadata, all non-imaging information like blood analytic, genetics, and the clinical history. And you can start looking into this as a very high-dimensional heterogeneous pattern that you try to build into some sort of Aetian model, for instance. Now, what we've done from all this work is primarily a lot of the processing components. And I want to talk you through some of those. I'm not going to go in a lot of detail of the segmentation because that's kind of the, the very basic step, but I can tell you this is still a very challenging one. So why? Because you have imaging from a number of modalities. I'm showing here just two to give you a sense, but you also have others. So you can get aneurysms morphology from 3D array. And that's great because it gives you a very nice resolution, isotropic resolution, but has a little problem. You need to catheterize the patient. So it, you normally do this when the patient is on the table already. So if you want to do planning, you know, you still can do it, but that means you will have to put the patient twice in the, in the table. The other option is that you go to non-invasive techniques like time of flight MRI or other techniques but they usually have a lower resolution, most of the times non-isotropic. Um, if you do rotational and geography, you have other problems. You don't see the full circle of Willis. You need to have multiple injections in order to reconstruct the whole circle of Willis. And then you have inter you know, problems of registering bits and pieces. Now, if you look at the images, even with the high resolution ones, the rotational and geography, you have problems like running, you know, kissing vessels, so vessels running very close to each other and close to the resolution and missing vessels which are close to the resolution. Part of that is unresolvable, but you need to be aware of. So we've done, some, we developed some methods. I'm not going to get into details of those, but we developed some methods and we validated them. I want to emphasize today the importance of validation as well. So we, had, we compared images from different centers with different type of scanners, a lot of manual cross-section measurements and then comparison between those and our techniques. And, well, to make a long story short, the, the accuracy is good when the method works. When it doesn't work, basically, it's very difficult to get anything to work, which is usually in all these difficult cases of missing, kissing vessels, and so on. Now, okay, say we have a segmentation. Now, what do we do with it? Well, 
the clinicians don't care about segmentations. What they care is about the decisions. And currently, most of the decisions for treatment are based on location, size, and shape. And by shape, they mean aspect rating. So this is a number of clinical measurements that have been shown in the literature. So these are all clinicians' measurements. They can look very complicated, but it's actually very simple. If you have an aneurysm, there are three main measurements, neck width, aneurysm diameter, and aneurysm depth. And if you make all the combinations, you know, all the, the combinations with repetition of these variables, you get all the different indexes that came in the literature. But from all of those, the most common one is the depth over the, depth over the neck width, and that is what is called aspect rate, and that's what most of the people use. And there is a rule out there that if this, the number is above 1.6, then it's risky. If it's below 1.6, it's not risky. And that's all the science behind, behind this. Now, we were not very happy with that, and we could imagine immediately doing 3D things. But we said, OK, the first thing you need to do, at least our experience is to convince a clinician is you can do the same they do, but now more accurately or automatic or faster or something where you win them. So we came up with some techniques for automatically isolating from a segmentation the neck of an aneurysm and then be able to do automatic measurements of the three indexes that are important to compute the aspect ratio. So this is an example on five cases. Um, and these are the, <coughs> the comparisons of manual versus automatic measurements of maximum neck, minimum neck, the depth, and the aspect ratio, which is the ratio of two of them. And we are quite a spot on with the exception of the last one, which is these bilobulated aneurysms, where we got confused by looking at only one of the lobules rather than the two. It's usually called a Mickey Mouse aneurysm because of the shape. Okay, so we failed with a Mickey Mouse. Now, once we show we could do what they do, we then sort of try to go beyond. And we said, okay, first we want to model things in 3D. Because we, it's stupid to have a 3D image for then making the maximum intensity projection and computer ratio. So the, other, the second thing we wanted to do is change a bit the thinking about how we compute the indexes. So clinicians, imagine these three cases. These three cases are aneurysms which are, the body of the aneurysm is identical, but the feeding system is completely different. And you need to know very little hemodynamics to, to know that this needs to be very different flows. So the risk could be very different potentially. But currently, because we look at aspect ratio, which is this over this, all of this is lost in the aspect ratio. So what we said is, OK, let's look at the complex of the aneurysm plus the feeding system by taking, I think it's one or two diameters in each direction of the feeding arteries. And then we look at this con construct, where each of them will be different again. And then we came up with something called Cernic moments that is like a sort of a spherical harmonic decomposition of the shape that allows you to reconstruct the shape by a series that as you put more and more orders, you get closer and closer to your original shape. Now, in fact, we don't use the moments of the Cernic, but we use some invariance of the moments so that we have invariance properties into that. And we also came up, this was our, our real contribution because Cernic moments have been invented before, of course. But we came up with a way to calculate them by reordering the, the, the summations that it speeds up three orders of magnitude, the calculation of them. And so this is basically how, as we add <coughs> modes, you get closer and closer to the original shape. And is a, is a complete basis, so that means you could potentially, with infinite coefficients, get perfect precision. Now, we compared the wrap, we compared the, this is the confusion matrix between the original labels of each of the aneurysms, so in a database of about 50 something, we knew which of them were unraptured and which were rapture, and we had the value that we knew from they had, and then what was the response of our classifier with using moments and using aspect ratio. And we got better sensitivity and particularly better specificity with this technique than the conventional index. The other interesting thing is these are Nick moments. Um, you could demonstrate that they are in dough of a distance, so that if you put aneurysms which are close by in this uh, invariance space, Aneurysms which are close by have equal similar shape, while aneurysms that are far apart have different shapes. So you can use this for hashing and for searching in a database, similar aneurysms to a given one. 
and there are, as I said, there are invariant properties to rotation, translation, scaling, and mirroring operations. So left and right can get the same parameters. So we developed one of the use cases we developed was a finally similar aneurysms, where the idea was that if you come particularly to an emergency room and you don't have time to go through a full CFD or do sophisticated things, if at least you could get the shape, and you can say, okay, bring me all the ones that are similar to that, those ones, we know the history of what happened to them, and we utilize that to do reasoning. It's a sort of a case-based reasoning. So we develop a little prototype that would do this by ranking all the aneurysms in our database by similarity index, so, and we could then query each of them and, re and retrieve all the information we knew. I'm just wondering, can you see, well, with, the, with this image, is it better to dim them somehow? Well, the other thing we did was to look at, say, okay, fine, we can measure shape statically, but these aneurysms, perhaps, in the area where they're going to burst, they have different mechanical properties in the wall. And we were hoping that that wall would be either more elastic or less elastic. You know, there were different logics for both hypotheses. So there was, we checked in the literature and there was little work on looking at pulsation. Most of that made on CT, multi-slice CT. <clears throat> but there was, and, and some of them pretty old, also with MR. Like in 93, there was this guy, Mayer, who showed that um, there was different volumes in diastole and systole computed with MR. But the resolution was very poor. So, and some of the papers that did CT of the brain, even the bone was pulsating. So I was a bit suspicious about what was going on there. So we said, okay, maybe we can do something with rotational angio as well. And the idea was the following. Rotational angiography currently, what your guys in Hamburg do, and you do here as well, is you, you take this, so this, this C arm rotates about, um, that there are about four seconds of full filling of the aneurysm with contrast. Hmm? So the full rotation is about six seconds, but you need to discard the first and the last usually because they are not completely filled with contrast. So you, you're left with about four. In that time, you get about 100 projections, which are isotropic with high-resolution pixels. And this usually covers more than 180 degrees, between 180 and 270 degrees. But what your colleagues in Hamburg do is primarily do a, reconst a static reconstruction from this. So they assume there is no motion, and they sort of reconstruct. But if you could actually do a synchronized physiological signal like um, ECG or blood pressure measurements and you can do that with a physiopack system that is connected to your X-ray machine to your rotational machine you can think about time stamping each of these frames with the time and then from this so you have basically the, the temporal correspondence on each of these frames and you can do a retrospective rebinning of the images into a canonical time frame now if you assume that a heartbeat is around one second and you have four seconds, that means for every angle we have approximately four views. So this is a multi-view dynamic scene reconstruction problem. So what we did is we used your static reconstruction. We put a freeform deformation field <coughs> on top of that with the splines. And then for each time point, we were, so we created an objective function that um, for each time point was constraining the deformation field to be such that the matching between the digital reconstructed radiograph you can generate from the 3D field and the actual X-ray, the rotation angio plane, were as close as possible. So basically you do an optimization that has all the different time points and the four views for each of the time points. If you do that and you get the optimizer to work, you, get actually the, the, you can get the pulsation as well. You can get the motion from this. So this is just an example with a phantom. Probably you don't see a thing here, but the aneurysm is there. And it's more flexible on one side than on the other. That's why you pulsate more on one side than on the other. And these are transcranial Doppler kind of measurements uh, where we show that the pulsation more or less follows the pressure, the Doppler um, signal as well. We also tested this idea on subjects. So for a number of subjects, we, we had the rotational angio and we had conventional X uh, DSA. So what we did is we compute the reconstruction of those images, plus um, we also computed measurements from the optimal views from DSA, and we did the blunt talman of one against the other. Huh? So we got actually quite um, good 
agreement, so less than, say, 0.1 millimeter between 3D array and DSA. Uh, and this is pretty much along all the excursion plates. Now, the advantage is that you can do this with just adding to the conventional protocol an additional, the, the triggering with a physiological signal, which is not always done. So from a patient point of view, the same radiation, the same everything. And you need to be a bit careful with injection so that you have at least four frames. The final part on this anatomy thing we did is, um, is useful when you do particularly fluid dynamics or when you want to do a statistics of anatomical parameters to have an idea about the location of the aneurysm. And if you could do that automatically, that would be great. So what we developed is a method for automatically labeling vascular segments. So if this is the circle of Willis, we normally say, well, this is the anterior communicating artery or the middle cerebral artery or the posterior communicating artery or the vascular artery, what we would like is to do that by automatically without having to point, point that. So what we develop is a sort of a graph that contains all the different vessels and their labels, but you also need to be mindful that there are some segments that may not be present and the patient be completely okay. So there is a lot of physiological variance with the circle of Willis. Not all patients have the same topology. So what we develop is a technique that utilizes, a, uh, that's a, a statistical uh, approach to graph matching where you develop a graph with the connections of all the different branches and for each of the nodes you assign properties that have to do with the, the angles between the different uh, daughter uh, branches and the parent artery and also the diameters of each of them so you, and, and the normals to each of them. So you have a feature vector <clears throat> and you then utilize this to match it to a library of graph where you have all the priors for the different anatomical configurations. Um, so, if you, if you do that, you can then generate automatically labels like this where you, um, each color corresponds to a particular label. So you can use this for assigning automatically boundary conditions, for instance. If you know each of these vessels have roughly a certain flow and you know the aneurysm core is somewhere in this one, you know, you know if, if it's in this vessel, you need to connect the boundary conditions that you know from these two arteries plus these two arteries and that gets a boundary condition of your aneurysm. Okay, so we look at shape, morphodynamic, and also how we can do labeling. Let's get a bit now into physics. So aneurysms can be, you know, the, the, the relationship between flow and aneurysms has, is kind of obvious on the one side, but at the same time it's not very clearly understood, the mechanism itself. It's clear that there has to be some connection, but not exactly what the mechanism is. And what is, also, what is known, or what has been shown, is that the flow of, say, take the wall shear stress parameter, is different in different phases of the aneurysm. So in, during initiation, appearance that the wall shear stress tends to be higher in areas that will develop blebs or ruptures, while it tends to be lower in areas like those in the process of growth and in the process of rupture afterwards. And there are some work that actually has argued for why this is the case. Now, someone was asking me yesterday, what, what do we need to do to get some of these tools to the clinics? And one of the things, and I think it's very complicated, because it's not about the clinicians only. I must say that the companies have a big responsibility as well. The, if you look at, this is a, a paper in a stroke in 2012, which does a guidelines for managing subarachno hemorrhage aneurysms, and so it's a consensus paper, the guidelines of the field, basically, the latest guidelines, that, and it's evidence-based. So it's quite interesting. Um, there is a statement in this, just cut and paste from this paper that says, in addition to the size and location of the aneurysms and the patient's age and health status, it might be reasonable to consider morphological, so 3D, proper, and hemodynamic characteristics of the aneurysms when discussing the risk of aneurysm rupture. And this has a level of evidence B, and is a new recommendation. So the clinical community is already acknowledging this is important. But I think to go from, it might be to, you definitely need to, <laughs> the difference is to have epidemiological studies. So studies that are large series where you demonstrate, you know, with the right, you know, the right, the right statistical power, the associations. And unfortunately, I think it's very difficult to do that unless the recent... <clears throat> certain basic tools, at least, in which to run them, because that trial will largely depend on the pipeline that was used as well, or will be related to the pipeline you use 
But I think this is quite hopeful in, in the sense that there is a potential here. So I introduced a bit this before. Let me just say a few additional things on this solver. So we use different solvers. This is the one with, uh, of Juan Sebral's parameters that we use at the beginning. Uh, we are currently using a lot the one from ANSYS as well, from CFX. And we have been using a bit of um, ACE, which is the one from ESI. Um, but in general, we use incompressible Newtonian fluids. We solve, of course, the Navier-Stokes equations. We assume vessels are rigid. And I'm happy to comment on that later on, but believe me, it's a reasonable assumption. And this one in particular uses an implicit finite element solver. And we put boundary conditions from the phase contrast MR measurements on a normal subject, so they are not patient specific. They are from a normal volunteer, but they are the same for every subject. So they are normalized. And if you do a transient flow fill with two million, you need about this time to run. Now, we looked at, I mean, there is no point in validating the solvers. This solver in particular has been validated and many of the other solvers have been shown to work in many domains. But what you do need to do is see how sensitive in your particular problem the solution is to a number of critical parameters. So that's why what we undertook was a sensitivity analysis, and these are only some glimpses of the study, which is reported here more than 10 years now ago. <clears throat> but we took four aneurysms, we made a, cross, a cut plane, and we look at four different time points. Um, so what you see here is the four aneurysms for one time point, which is diastole, I think. And we, used, we defined the base configuration and then we said, okay, if instead of assuming a Newtonian fluid, we assume a non-Newtonian rheological model, like a Sun model in this case, how does it vary? What happens if we modify a bit the, the blood flow in the inlets by an increase, say, of 10% or by a decrease of 10%, the nominal baseline configuration value? How much does the flow vary? And... We did this for one time point and, you, and for wall shear stress, but you can do the same for all the different parameters. And these are the same, but for the four time points that we looked at each of them. And we looked, as I said, to baseline, Casson, increasing the flow, reducing the flow, but also what happens if you have two other guys doing the segmentation. So if you change the modeler, the geometry. Now, to make a long story short, this problem is a very geometry-driven flow. So the most, important criteria, the most important source of variability is shape. The second one is shape. The third one is shape. And then after that, everything else. Okay? So you need to get a good segmentation in the first place. That's a, the summary. Um, one of the things we also thought is that perhaps to combat part of this variability, you shouldn't be using like... A, absolute values of flow, or, but, but rather some sort of semi-quantitative characterization where you compute the flow, which is quantitative, but then you define some generic patterns of the flow. So you basically uh, cluster the patterns into a few intuitive flow patterns, and you use those to do the classification because we were hoping that those patterns would going to be more stable than the original one. So what sort of things I'm talking about here? Like, for instance, what is the flow impingement region? Is it neck, the body, the dome, or the lobulation? What is the size of the impingement region, so the point where it hits the wall? Is it small or large? What is the size of the inflow shed when it goes through the neck? Is it small and thin or large and thick? What is the sort of complexity and stability of the flow pattern? Is it, you know, complex means does it have vortexes or not? And stability is, is the pattern, whichever it is, stable throughout the cardiac cycle, or does it change between diastole and systole? So some flow, some flow patterns have a vertex, vortex that is throughout the, the whole cycle all the time there. Some others actually have a vortex that is created in systole, but not in diastole, for instance. So that's what we meant here. So these are semi-quantitative, because you first need to do the flow simulation, but then you end up not using the values, you end up using this sort of characterization. <clears throat> so these are the sort of transient simulations of um, for instance, the impingement, the flow impingement region in different areas, or you even have a category which is changing because it takes more than one of those throughout the cardiac cycle. 
and these are, for instance, the impingement regions, whether they are small or large. Now, we did some statistics where we correlated those parameters with the rupture information and non rupture information. And what we found is that aneurysms that have a small impingement um, size, they tend to be rupturing most of the times. So, well, while actually the aneurysms that have a wide and gentle pressure over the aneurysm wall, they tend to be um, kind of more, um, less dangerous, let me put it that way. Now, it's, it's quite, Com, um, it's quite um, interesting this because someone could say, well, if you are with a hose, eh, pressing, putting pressure on the back of the balloon, you're more likely to break it than if you put the finger in the middle and you, spread, you spray the water through the wall, right? So the, you may associate that with the pressure that you're ex ex exerting over the wall. But what is important to, to realize is that these, the, the elevation of pressure that you're doing because of this is of a few millimeters of mercury compared to the 100 millimeters that you have on the systemic pressure. So it's very little extra pressure you're exerting. So the, the, the thoughts are more that this is not related to an overpressure, but more related to a sort of a disturbance of the flow direction over the cardiac cycle that debilitates the endothelial cells and on the longer term sort of weakens the wall to the point that they break. And then the overpressure could come from other things, like a moment where you do an extra effort, like you run for a bus, or you do something kind of that gives the extra kick. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that different modalities can be, imaging modalities can be used at different time points in the care cycle. And rotational angiography, you tend to use it during the intervention. And that it, you might want to do preoperative planning with other modalities like CT. So is there a difference between doing fluid dynamics with rotational angio and doing it with CT? That was the question we were trying to answer here. So just to give you an idea about what changes from one modality to the other, I show you here the same patient done with X rotational angiography and done with CT. And you, you see that there are under segmentations in CT some cases, so there is undulations that you don't have here. You also sometimes miss some of the uh, outlets, the small outlets, and also you have a widening of the neck because of the lower resolution. So this in invagination somehow gets shortened um, and therefore the, the neck gets widened. And that is not very good. So <clears throat> we looked at a number of subjects. So when I show you now the next pictures, you will see always in the first row the rotation on geography for five patients and in the lower one, the CT for the same patients. These are only five of about 11 that we analyze that we try to cover different anatomical locations. So what happens to a streamlined wall shear stress and oscillatory shear indexes? Now, if you look carefully to these, they, are, they tend to be pretty similar with the exception perhaps of this one, where in the case of the rotation and geography, sorry, of the CTA, we lost completely the um, outlet that was coming out of the aneurysm so the, this is rotational angio, so this is the gold standard. That's what happened with the outlet, it was turning, while because here it was lost, the user essentially made an extrusion of the wall to the best of his imagination. And he got it wrong. And that has a major impact on the fluid dynamics. Okay? So the message is, if you get the geometry wrong, then it has a huge impact. As long as you are broadly within the geometry correct, then actually it doesn't matter a lot which is the, the, the modality you use. Now, more quantitatively, we've done it. So we looked at two things. We looked at a lot of flow-related variables like you know, mean inlet area, the neck area, the aneurysm volume, the mean velocity at the inlet. And some of them were also normalized, like the, normalized, the mean wall shear stress normalized at the parent vessel. So to have normalized values so that they were I hopefully less depending on boundary conditions. Now, anything you do like this will show you that you have all these variables with errors, say, up to 50% in the absolute, absolute magnitude of the variable you're looking into. <clears throat> However, what we also did is look at all these variables that I introduced before, these qualitative variables, and we, if, if you think of them as categories, you can ask two observers to classify the flow field into those categories. And what you can do is compute basically um, utilize techniques from a statistics to look at inter-rater agreement to actually analyze how much agreement there is between these observers. And in particular, you can use, or is mostly used, the Kappa statistics. So if you do 
Kappa statistic analysis of you know, the ability to classify and all these ones, you will see that you have massively high values of, of the Kappa statistics. So that means that why we can have important errors in the absolute values, the stability of the pattern, the, the pattern's structure is very similar. And that means that if you develop a classification scheme through that, you're going to be on the right, on the right side. Something we, we are actually developing at the moment is that the same way that we developed these unique moments for the shape, we said, why cannot we develop some equivalent index for the flow, some index that measures the flow complexity? And surprisingly, there isn't a, there isn't a lot of work on how to do comparison of flow fields. There are, there are some works, but not a lot of them. So um, I want to show you just the gist of it, because this is kind of work in progress a bit. So what we want is to be able to look at an aneurysm like this and have a number that tells us how complex the flow is so that I can do classifications on the basis of flow without having to go through these qualitative categories. So the idea we came up with was inspired by communication channels. So in information theory, in, communi in communication theory, you can, you can look at this vessel as a communication channel where you have a transmitter and a receiver on the other side, and the channel basically is communicating information. You could think about your particles of flow as kind of you know, communication bits. And if this was a straight tube, every particle left in a position will come out on the same position on the other end, right? And if you do the mutual information between the beginning and end, you will be able to predict exactly where everything is going to be in the end based on where things are at the beginning. The minute you start twisting the, ta the, the tube or, or bending it, or let alone to put an aneurysm so that some of the flow fields come in and out, you start getting delays, mixing, right? And all that messes about your flow, that means the complexity increases, but also your ability to predict the input based on the output becomes less and less you know, clear. Well, that's the intuition of the methodology. There's a lot of math behind doing that. Um, but we came up with this interlacing complexity index, and we studied how it works, and it's really quite interesting. Now, the point is that we found that if you compute this interlacing index and you divide aneurysms that were classified as being having a simplex flow or a complex flow, a stable flow or an unstable flow, according to the previous categories, you have a perfect distinction, very good distinction between them, just using this new index that we are introducing. So essentially, this index captures a bit the intuition of the other more intuitive indexes, but it does it in a more mathematical manner and in a less... Okay, other things you can do is... Um, you can utilize these techniques to start. So we, remember at the beginning, when I show you this pyramid, I was saying the first level is the data, then we have to do the processing bit, but then there is the knowledge one, which is trying to put things in context. So all these other papers are trying to put things in context. We're able to run these on particular databases, and we are trying to understand how particular classes of aneurysms behave with respect to flow, or what flow patterns are more or less risky. So for instance here, this is a study we did where we looked at terminal aneurysms and we found that there are three types of flows depending on how the flow divides. And we also found that this particular pattern, the type B, was the most associated with rupture risk. We also looked at the effect of smoking and hypertension. So this is a model where we model smoking and hypertension by changing the combination of boundary conditions and the rheological model because you can change the hematocrite. There is a study that link hematocrite with uh, blood sorry, the, the blood viscosity with, with smoking. So you can look at how subjects that, you know, under the condition of a smoking, how does the flow change. And the other thing we've been doing more recently is to say, well, this idea of the boundary conditions, we were unsatisfied with the fact that we were using boundary conditions of a normal subject. But then we said, what can we do better than that? Because if we now go and we do a full detailed flow measurements of the patient, the moment that we have him or her being, the Im being done the imaging, does this gives us actually a lot more information than the, 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 by the boundary conditions of a normal? Because we know those boundary conditions will be at that particular moment when the guy was doing the scanner. And they will be depending on whether the guy had or not a coffee before and will be very different to what happens when the guy goes running in the afternoon. So we are working with the hospital in Italy, in Venice, where 
we had 100 subjects, half of them are, MC, are um, male cognitive impairments, or elderly with male cognitive impairment, and the other half are controls, uh, because this is done in, a neuro, in the context of a neuro project. And we developed models of how, so we, we have halters from them for 24 hours, and we have measurements of ECG, blood pressure, gait, and also you know, the rest of the uh, demographics of individuals. So we are able to generate Gaussian, sorry, and carotid ultrasound as well. So we are able to generate a virtual population of flow waveforms where we also incorporate the statistics of variability over the day. So we, have, we are able to have now stochastic boundary conditions that give us a sense of how actually those boundary conditions will change throughout the day of the individual. The idea is that we utilize this and we are still thinking how exactly we, we should be doing this more efficiently. But, you know, for those of you who come from finite elements, there are techniques for doing stochastic finite elements where, we, where you can do solve the equations kind of for the mean and for the covariance matrix of the, the noise of the uncertainty. And then you have the flow fields, the average flow field for your boundary condition, average boundary conditions, and also a measure of uncertainty in them. So we are starting to look at, for instance, this is how the the um, ICA waveform variability affects the intraneurismal flow. And we have seen that the changes in, in ICA waveform variability produce changes in the, in, in the flow in specific areas of the aneurysm, so the rest is more or less stable, that are the ones that are usually associated with rupture. So that is interesting. <coughs> okay, so the final part <coughs> is I'm is how we utilize this technique on the more predictive angle. So I said, we, we want to use predictive imaging, we want to develop predictive imaging, which is the idea of making assessment of certain variables in situations that we cannot actually measure. So this is useful in particular in the context of intervention. So first intervention type that I want to present is stenting. And, well, probably you know a lot about this, but stenting, depending on the geometry of the stent and the design of the stent, you have huge out difference in outcome. You can also have difference in outcome depending on operator skills, and you can also have different adverse configurations that you would like to be able to predict ahead of time because they lead to thrombosis. Now, how aneurysms are planned today, this is kind of the drawing from one of the clinicians I collaborate with, and I would say, you know, Daniel, could you explain me how you plan aneurysms? And he said, well, imagine we have a terminal aneurysms, uh, aneurysm here. I put a stent into this direction that will redirect the flow this way. I will remain having flow in this way because the resistance here will be low, so it will suck bloody out, blood out, if, because this is <coughs> low porosity, but there is tr transfer of blood. However, here, the blood flow will be more stagnated and that will promote on the middle term coagulation and that will close the aneurysm. And they say, okay, so and why do you need to put it this way and not the other way? And that is when they start, well, arguing that this is all about experience and how much they have seen in the past. Okay? So that's where the art comes into place. So I said, hang on a minute. What about if you give you a system like this? That you see the flow before you do anything and we actually can put all these stents in the different configurations that are possible. And I show you that actually the magnitude of the velocity or the, pr or the pressure drop or the wall shear stress is very depending on what you do. Could you use this actually to decide which way you go? And by the way, this is just one stent, but what happens if I give you the five stents you have in a stock and you can actually choose a stent as well, not only the, where you put it. So I say, well, that's nice. So that's what basically what we try to do. Now, to do this, you need to implement a way to do virtual stenting. So this is some work where we develop a technique based on deformable models that actually gives you an idea about where the stent will end up um, and is flexible enough so that you can put different blueprints of different types of the stents. So these are two commercial stents from Cordis and Balt that have different types of cells. And because this model utilizes like a sort of a deformable tube, you can put any type of blueprint on, on the deformable tube. But in fact, you use through this, uh, so you have the, the, the tube is like with a, with a simplex mesh, and this drawing allows you to do links between the different elements in your mesh. So you can put the structural constraints 
to the deformation so that the deformation is going to be different for this than for this step. Now, this is not utilizing proper structural mechanics, the deployment. That's why it takes only a minute, and it works even in complicated geometries. But in order to convince ourselves that this was working fine, what we did is we worked with people in Milan who are experts in the structural mechanics of the stents and where they do modeling of the material and modeling of the crimping process and everything. So what you see here is their deployment, and this is our deployment, which is a fast virtual stenting. So we compare this in a number of scenarios, and there is a couple of papers showing all the results. The, the long, to make a long story short, um, in the case of a straight vessels or curved vessels, we have errors between 8 and 17%, and most of this error is along the stand direction, which is where the most of the uncertainty is. However, in the radial direction, which is the interesting one, it's about 10 times less than that. Okay? So they are really good. Now, you won't see a thing here unless I take the lights, but what I think I need five minutes. So what we did here was to compare a virtual experiment. So we took, we took a physical phantom and a physical stent. We did the micro CT of the stent and an X-ray of the phantom. So we generated two digital models, one for the stent and one for the phantom. So we did the deployment of the virtual device in the virtual model, and we insert the physical device in the physical model. And we did rotation and angiography for both. So you could see roughly where they fall. But what was more interesting that the clinicians advised us to do this experiment was to look at the time dilution curves. So forget about the blue line because that's a measurement somewhere here. The other two lines are lines in the middle of the volume. This is the real image, the one on the left, and this is the simulated image, the one on the right. And you have the time dilution curves are pretty much on top of each other. Okay? And we did that. This is for one of the stents, but we did this for both the stents, and it's the same. So now you can give this sort of simulation results to the clinician to look at different treatment options. The other thing you can do is you can run, if you have a library of geometries, you can do an implantation of all these devices in the geometries, and you can then do kind of a virtual trial where you look at how a particular device behaves across a number of anatomies and what are the hemodynamic implications of that. And Finally, you can do the same with coils, although with coils it's a bit more challenging because coils are more like a stochastic process because you're putting these coils one after the other and it's very difficult to predict where coils will end up. So one could wonder what are you going to plan, right? You're not going to plan the position of them. So hopefully I'll convince you that this is quite important as well. So what we did is the following, just to show that this is kind of a stochastic. This is the mesh of coils with an aneurysm. This is a histology where you see all the struts. So it's a mess, they're everywhere. So we develop a technique. In fact, someone who is working for Philips now, Hernan, was the one who developed this technique, Hernan Morales, who is in Paris. Uh, that is kind of a minimum cost path where it's like a, a crawling stand that goes moving around the aneurysm and trying to fill it because that's what the aneurysm tries to do, fill the maximum volume, but has some physical constraints, so it cannot self-penetrate, it cannot go through the wall, uh, it cannot bend 180 degrees because, you know, it will imply like a very uh, high curvature. So there's a number of things that it cannot do. And we can generate virtual coils, coilings. So look at this. This table for every co column we have a number here, 20, 25, 32. This is what is called the packing rate. It's the amount of volume of coils divided by the volume of the aneurysm itself. It's how much of the aneurysm you have filled with metal, basically. Yeah? So this is 20%, 25, 32. The different colors represent different coils, so you can have more than one. In practice, aneurysms, you can get between 5 and 32 in a, in a procedure. Each of them is about 1,000 pounds. So if you put two or three less, it's a lot of money. So what we've done, what, what you can show from this, sorry, I forgot one thing. 
the, the rows. What are the rows? The row says configuration A, B, and C. Imagine that the placement of the, of the calls is like a random field eh, that tells you where there is a call and where there isn't. This is something, configuration A, a is like asking a clinician to put the calls the first time to a given packing rate. When you're done, you say, okay, take a picture. Now take them out. You take them out to all the calls. The second column is, okay, let's do the experiment again. Put them again. You put a second time the calls for each of them at the packing rate. Take a picture. You take them out again. You do it third time. And you can do it as many times as you want. You wouldn't be able to do this in a patient, but you can do that in a simulation. Now, if you do that, what you can see is that the flow reduction due to 20% packing on average is given by these curves. You need to look at these curves in a bit of detail, but if you follow my reasoning, is the equivalent. When you go above 25%, it doesn't matter how you put the calls. So the amount of flow reduction is irrespective of the configuration. And this percentage, 25, depends on the subject. So for some subjects, they may need 28%. For some others, they need 22%. Now, why this is important? Because I know that if I reach the percentage that fulfills this property, I don't need to put more because they're useless. So I can save money. But I also know that I shouldn't be putting less than that because otherwise it does depend on the way I put the calls. That means it will depend on the operator and all the things we don't want it to depend on. So that's what you can plan, the optimal packing rate. Now, how you validate this? So imagine these are all the six configurations for the same packing rate. What you can do is a virtual histology. So you cut a plane. You have all the cross-sections of all the struts. And then you can look at the statistics of the struts in different locations, the neck, the center, and the base, and the inside and the surface. And you can do this on, in this case, an animal model of a rabbit where we did have also histology, and we have this, the, the strut, so we could count the same areas in, this, in our virtual histology and in a real histology. And if you do that and do the statistics <clears throat> to compare how these two relate, after this is also published, after reading all these curves, you find that actually they are very equivalent. So the way we distribute the calls with our method and in an animal models are very similar. And also you can do the virtual angiogram that we did with the, stent, with the stent. And if you look at all these positions, this is just where the flow is not developed and is the beginning of the flow. But if you look at everywhere else, the two curves of the virtual and the measurement are pretty much on top of each other as well. Okay? So hemodynamically they are consistent. Geometrically they seem to be consistent too. And it's useful to make predictions of optimal packing rate. That's kind of the take-home message. So on the benefit of time, I'm going to save these three slides. This was just to put a bit, remind a bit what we said at the beginning. And hopefully I've shown that you can use this com combination of imaging and modeling in a synergistic way. They provide you a way to do what they require to do more accurate imaging, to be able to have accurate models. But also the addition of modeling adds a, prescript a predictive layer on top of the former. Um, and the part that I just skipped at the beginning, but this you guys know much better than I, is that it's not just about developing a new technology, it's about trying to convince the users about it. And this is what we've done in a number of training courses where we brought the prototypes and we were able to actually show, you know, through some questions, we identified the two use cases that were the most relevant and we were able from year to year to track how our progress was by the response we were having with this new, you know, bunch of clinicians, essentially. Um, I would also add that something that we are not very good at in the university is to understand also the business model implications of some of this. So I think one of the reasons why Philips, as far as I know, hasn't pushed forward with this is because of the way they saw this taking in terms of sales. Not because the worrying clinicians convinced, and as you saw from, the, from these um, guidelines, you know, the clinical field seems to be interested in this, but for reasons that somehow escape a bit to me. Um, But I think that the next, to, to, to make the next step to me is not about more technology development. It's about eventually prototyping the sort of things we, that Philips essentially has and then 
essentially do a very good prospective trial that publishes in a New England Journal of Medicine with the statistics about how good this is in predicting rupture risk. I think that is what is required at the minute, more than, than further technology development. At least that's my personal view. Okay, so thanks a lot. Hope it was useful and interesting. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes, it works. Hey, thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have a question. You said that shape, shape, shape is very important in your in your uh, in your simulation. It depends a lot on that. Um, if you do a uh, image recording, let's say with CT, I think the resolution will be 100 micron. Yeah, and if you have an aneurysm of three millimeters, what, would be, what is the effect of such an error in your picture? You, <clears throat> sorry, you say that the resolution of CT would be 0.1 millimeter. I think this is huge, hugely high. I think it's a lot less than that. Okay. So with CT, at least, and that, that 0.1 would be probably in micro CT, if anything, or maybe in one of the very latest uh, scanning techniques, but not, definitely not what they're using in the clinic. I mean, you have 0.2 with rotational angio, and that is considered to be the highest at the moment. Um, but I think that's not your point. I think your point is, can you, given a, a given accuracy in geometry, tell something about what the accuracy in flow will be? And the, and the answer to that is, what do you want to do with the flow? If with the flow, what you want to do is classify patients at risk of rupture versus patients not at risk of rupture, if it's a, a basically a decision support question, I think you can. You can do that. I think that's what we demonstrated because you don't need to rely on the absolute value of the flow parameters to do that quantification. You can do with a lot less than that. But if what you want to do is, I don't know, understand the, the remodeling of the wall, then that's a different story. And for that, I don't think that's probably enough. Okay. And the other thing, just for the avoidance of any doubt, when I was saying shape, shape, and shape, I don't mean you could then ask, well, then why you care about flow? Because what I was trying to explain is what is the parameters that affect the flow, not how important different parameters are in the prediction of rupture. So for the prediction of rupture, I think flow is important. But if flow depends a lot on the geometry, if it's very sensitive, you need to be very careful to have a reasonable, a reasonable accuracy. Okay? Thank you very much. Being a fluid analyst myself, I liked your presentation very much. But I have only limited knowledge about rupture from metals and glasses. And I would expect some kind of a rupture model, say there's a certain threshold stress that the material can support, and especially fluctuations of the stress that will lead to material fatigue. So I would expect the normal stresses, like pre mostly pressure, and the, the fluctuation, fluctuating component of that to be very important, rather than the wall shear stress. Could you comment on the prospect of predicting rupture from material properties and novel stresses. Yeah, so thanks. I'm, I'm not so much into that field, but I have worked with people that are. So what I'm gonna tell you is mostly what I heard from them, okay? So, the, um, the, the main, so there are models, and in particular there are people like Paul Wattom and, and Harold Holsafel who have been looking into these sort of rupture models. And they try to model the, the vascular wall and the constituents and do um, sort of constitute models of the vessels and so on. But the problem that all these models have is they're very useful in terms of understanding the mechanism or at least try to explain the mechanism. But when it comes to do patient-specific predictions, there is so many unknowns in those models, so many things that you cannot get a hope on even measuring them, 
that it becomes very impractical from that point of view. So the problem is not the lack of a model, it's the personalization of the model. And unless you do this personalization, you actually cannot have predictions. So what people have been doing is look at surrogates and indirect measurements. So I think that's kind of the, the summary of the, of the answer to that. So is there a possibility to... Um, so, sorry, and one other thing is the difficulty in measuring, and even if you would have the measurements, even if you could have the measurements on a patient, there is a second thing which is the difficulty in validating those models because it would imply that you have follow-up measurements on the individual from before until after the point of rupture, which from an ethical point of view would be very difficult to, to gather. So that's, that's it's kind of the whole methodology is not limited really by the computational side or the ability to model, it's limited by the data and the experimental aspects. Uh, I think that's why that hasn't been developed a lot, my, my, my view on that. I don't know if that addresses a bit your... The, the other part of the question was, why is it, I, I didn't understand why, while, well, shear stress is more important than the normal component, especially if you have time dependent, the, the time dependent solution. Well, the oscillatory shear index is the variability over the cardiac cycle of that normal component. And the, and the wall shear stress has been used a lot because there, are some, there is some work in the literature that shows that the disturbance of the flow. So the vessels are used to see the flow going in one direction. And the endothelial cells, that's a signal they get. Is, you know, flow is going this way. The minute there is an obstacle or a blob somewhere that messes about the flow, this flow changes the local direction and the vessels sort of apparently don't get the signals that they should get. And that has led to sometimes weakening of the wall because like the constituents start to, to kind of dis, disorganize and disarrange and that leads to weakening of the wall and eventually to rupture. <clears throat> and that has been associated with the wall shear stress or with tangential component. I think it has to do also because it has directional flow information. It's not like a balloon where, you know, where the air is static and it's just pressurizing outwards. Thanks a lot.